Okay, so let's get started. So this is our second uh, podcast, and today we have we are with uh, Robert uh, Fletcher. How are you, Robert? I'm fine, thank you very much, Roman. It's good to be with you. I'm very happy to to meet you. I'm very impressed with what you're going to do and what you have done before. Well, thank you, but I don't think it's all that impressive. Uh, you know, just uh, me doing my normal kind of normal life kind of uh, things as well. But thank so, you. Okay, can you tell us a little bit more about you before we get started and tell us who you are? Well, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Robert Fletcher. I'm a Canadian, born in Canada, raised in Canada, Western Alberta. Um, in the oil country and cattle country of Canada. Um, went to school there. As a youth, I played all kinds of sports, uh, football, hockey, uh, baseball. Oh, maybe all your listeners, uh, I better say it's ice hockey mm -hmm. uh, that I played. And the football is American football, not real football. Real football. <laughs> the real football, yeah. yeah. Other sports uh, along the way is skiing, a lot of skiing and, and golf and, and running, uh, triathlons, uh, sailing. So always active in the outdoor world. I went to school, got married there, raised a family, uh, married for 48 years uh, with the same woman for 55 years because we're high school sweethearts. Uh, Congratulations. The university. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, went to school, uh, university there, I uh, got uh, graduate degrees in education and then spent 30 years uh, working with the Edmonton Public School Board as a teacher of mathematics and an administrator. Um, Amazing. Then I retired 25 years ago and decided that I would like to spend my winters in warm climates rather than cold climates. So a lot now of you live in Costa Rica, there. right? Now I live in Costa Rica almost full time. Uh, I'm there on a tourist visa, so I have to leave every 90 days and go somewhere and ride a bike in some other country, something like that. Yeah. It's a little bit warmer than Canada. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm in Vancouver right now. It's not bad here. I think yesterday it was about eight degrees, but Costa Rica was 32 degrees. So uh, <laughs> it can get cold in Canada at times, especially right. this part of the year. Yeah. Does it get cold in Costa Rica as well? No, never. No, never. I think the <laughs> coolest day I've seen was 27. Oh, all right. <laughs> Must be freezing for you in Canada right now. Well, I got I stopped in Toronto and they had a big blizzard and snow everywhere. And I didn't have a lot of warm clothes. And I had to wait for the shuttle bus for the hotel. And man, it was cold. <laughs> Just uh, really cold. So can you tell us a little bit uh, more about your, your achievement? What are your biggest achievements? Well, in reality, I think it's raising two children and having a family was a great achievement. Uh, looking back over the years and the things that we did together as a family, uh, and uh, I think that was a, a good achievement. Uh, secondary would be, uh, you know, education and my career in the teaching children i loved it i never uh, never had a day that i didn't want to go to work and that uh, i think is a good sign that i picked the right career um, so they're not big achievements but they're achievements that i i think are important to me and that uh, i did throughout the life uh, and when when did, other... you, when did you begin traveling what was your first travel Oh, my wife was the instigator for travel, I think. Uh, she went to Europe before we were married and did her traveling, then came back and uh, we got married in um, 1968. Uh, I applied for grad, grad school and the dean told me, no, you better go get some life experience uh, sort of thing. So I came home and told my wife that I can't get into grad school right now. She says, good, let's go to Australia. I said, what? Yeah, let's go to Australia. So uh, since 1968, we arrived in New Zealand and Australia and 
started teaching there. I got a job there. And then after a year and a half, uh, she said, well, it's time to go and complete the journey around the world. So we did that. And uh, that led to traveling uh, for me uh, ever after kind of thing. Where when, did you go? So six, pardon? Where did you go when you traveled around the world? Where did you go? Oh, well, that time uh, we sailed, uh, cruised over to uh, New Zealand and Australia. And then when we left there, we flew up to uh, Indonesia, Singapore, and then into um, Nepal. And then in Nepal, we caught a bus called the Overlanders. And a group of us, mostly Australians, uh, got on the bus and went through India, Pakistan, uh, um, Iran, Turkey, uh, into Europe, and ended up in London, England about four months later. And then we bought a van, my wife and I, and we went back on the continent, traveled around, hit all the countries of Europe uh, camping uh, before we arrived back in Edmonton in late August 1970 and started teaching with Edmonton Public School Board. I was traveling back then. Traveling was good. Uh, was it safe? It was safe. I I never had any problems. Uh, you know, we went from one country to the other. Uh, no problems on the borders or anything. Uh, we had to avoid uh, Iraq because they were at war at that time, Iran and Iraq. So we never got that way. We went up through Turkey. And how, how did you prepare your, your journey? What would you generally do to prepare your journey like this? That one uh, was, uh, let's get an atlas out, get a globe out. Let's see how we can get to this bus in Nepal. And, uh, oh, okay, here's a lot of countries. And then it was, how do we get from Singapore to Bangkok? and from Bangkok over to India. So planning, looking at the, we didn't have internet or anything at that yeah, time. Yeah, that's what just, I wanted to uh, say, no internet at the time. At, <laughs> yeah, just looking at books and talking to people. Uh, exactly. Our, that's we what used a lot of net, a yeah. lot of networking because there were a lot of Americans that were Peace Corps people. So you would meet them, oh, we're going that way, you're coming this way, where did you stay, what did you do, that kind of thing. So word of mouth was a big, big yeah, thing. We, we talk about this on the, on the previous uh, podcast that uh, backpackers now have internet, they have their phone, they can Google anything they want, they can find anything they want. I started myself traveling in 2004 and in 2004 we still didn't have smartphone and everything and as you said we used to talk to people to go somewhere and we had books <laughs> that was, was, yeah that was it we didn't have any gps to tell us where to, how to get to the hotel or anything else yeah exactly to figure it out, you know yeah that was the adventure to find your hotel was an adventure <laughs> exactly <laughs> to make sure make sure the cab driver wasn't taking you on a ride around the city uh, you yeah know, that kind of thing yeah what, what do you think about the traveling now, like with the internet, with the smartphone, with everything? Do, do you prefer traveling back then or you think that it's much better traveling with the technology that we have today? I think it's good both ways. The only thing I think that's changed for me is the long airplane flights. I don't like uh, the 14 hour <laughs> flights. Maybe I never liked them, but uh, I'm the, same. The, the plane and the hassle now, especially now with COVID, you got to do so many things to yeah. get on the plane, even before you get to the airport. But yeah, it's a lot easier now. Uh, you want to plan something, somebody's already done it, or there's a Facebook group you can go on and read about all their questions and problems they've had. So it's yeah. pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in July this year, you are planning to do a 13,500 kilometer cycling from Alaska to Costa Rica. So can you tell us a little bit more about this? This was uh, started about a year ago. Uh, sort of a New Year's resolution or oh, what will I do for this New Year's? What can I do that's a little different? And um, I got thinking ahead that, 
well, this year I'm entering in my 80th year. I'm only 79, but I am in the 80th year. So there's a birthday coming up. What can I do to celebrate it? And um, I said, well, I don't just want to have a party and uh, bring some fellows over and couples and do the normal birthday cake thing. So what kind of adventure can I do to celebrate this milestone for me? And then uh, I thought, well, I haven't been to West, West Africa. Maybe I can go over and knock off some countries over there. And, and my Gloria, my partner, my, said, no, you're not doing that. Uh, I can't leave. I got to work. So you can't do that. Okay, I'm going to the Amazon and do something there. Well, <laughs> he said, oh, rem remember when we were in the Amazon, you didn't like it. It was boring on the river. We've been there before in the part of Peru with the Amazon. And uh, she said something like, you know, she's from, uh, she's a Colombiana from Colombia. You know, you're going to have to eat the uh, monkey brains and snakes if you go that way. And I said, okay, I'll forget that. I don't want, I want to do that. But it wasn't until I watched the series on Apple TV with uh, Ewan McGregor and Charlie Bronfman. They ride their motorcycles around the world and they've got three a uh, long way around. They go around the world, long way down. They left the top of Scotland and went to Cape Town, South Africa. And then the third one, they left. Uswela, Argentina, and rode to Los Angeles, but they rode on electric bicycle, uh, electric motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And I said to Gloria that that's it. I can do that. I can get electric bicycle and I can ride from Alaska down to Panama. Um, and that's when I made up my mind and started working on it. And it's taken a year now, and I've only got five months left to, to, before I start. But uh, been a long journey up to here. A long journey. So you train every yeah. day, yeah? Uh, well, sometimes life gets in the way and you've got to go shopping or uh, do some other chores around the house and things like that. But I try and get out at least five days a week. Uh, and on the weekends when Gloria is not working, she preferred to go to the beach or someplace rather than <laughs> stay home, you know. So five days a week is, is good. It's good. People uh, try and get in. Uh, pardon? Go, go for it. Go for it. Oh, I was going to say, I try and get in a, a thousand kilometers a month of riding is sort of a, a good standard that I've used for uh, going on a bicycle trip and being in shape. That seems to, to work for, for me. I can get in three, four months of a thousand kilometers prior to a ride. Central America is well known for being dangerous. Are you not scared cycling in Central America? Well, uh, I've been asked this a few times, and I think there's more danger in Alaska and the Yukon uh, with the bears than uh, <laughs> uh, hiding through Central America. And Central America gets a bad rap. Uh, you know, the, con the press concentrates on a few people that have some problems or big problems, I guess. Uh, the people in Central America, uh, and I've ridden in Mexico and Costa Rica, Panama, Nicaragua, are wonderful. And they're happy to see you. And bicycling is a form of transportation there. So uh, you, never you are fairly me. safe. You're fairly safe on the roads uh, in Canada and U.S. Uh, the guys in the pickup trucks, they don't seem to like people on bicycles very much. So you sometimes can get into a little bit of such situations or them coming too close to you and honking horns and giving you the finger and things like that in yeah. North America and Canada. So, no, I'm not worried about the cartels and kidnappings. <laughs> they will stop you to, to asking you what the hell you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's usually a case the crowd gathers around with questions of where are you coming from, what are you doing, how old are you, you know, how much did your bike cost, things like that, you know. <laughs> so do you got some sponsors and where people can find a way to, to helping you with your with your trip? I do have I have some excellent sponsors. Uh, 
I don't know whether I can say them on the, your podcast or not. But I'm yeah, of course, yeah. Right. We put them in the description below so people can can have oh, a look yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, one of my uh, big sponsors is Airbnb. Is everybody around the world knows them, and um, that's really helping with uh, us for getting accommodation. But what I liked about Airbnb is we get to stay with local people, uh, maybe uh, the families and the hostess in their home that uh, I think will be important uh, just to enjoy the journey. And usually I'm a guy that's more about the destination than the journey. And this time I've told my riding partner, no, this time, Wayne, we're all about the journey and uh, we're going to enjoy it. And it's not so much of let's get from A to B as fast as we can. Uh, so Airbnb is going to be important uh, for the combination, but meeting the people, especially in Latin America, I think is big. Um, Evalo Bicycles, an American company out of Seattle, is been fantastic. They are supplying the bicycles, our uniforms, uh, spare parts, uh, generators, inverters, uh, everything that we need to carry battery, extra batteries to carry out this project. Um, and it's electric bike, and it's called uh, the Atlas model, is what we'll be riding. Uh, on this journey so you're going to be able to uh, recharge your bike every night uh yes um uh, that was sort of part of how to go about planning and um, because i've run bicycle tours in costa rica and i've had a couple of electric bikes that i rent to people coming on the tours i'm used to getting them through a distance of 100 or 120 kilometers a day on batteries so uh, each bike will have two batteries we'll also have a spare battery a fifth battery so i could have up to three batteries a day when i deplete one battery it comes off the bike it goes in the support vehicle on the charger on the inverter and it can charge another maybe half a battery in half a day so we've got lots of that. The pot, at night in the Alaska, Yukon, Mexican desert, we may be without power uh, when we're camping. So we're taking a small generator, uh, gasoline powered generator to power our cooking equipment and chargers for iPhones and computers, but also the batteries. So uh, oh, heavy is I the don't bike. Yeah, pardon? How heavy is the bike with the battery? Oh, I I have not ridden the bike. I have not seen the bikes. All right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm, they're going to be about six, about 60 pounds uh, each. 60 the pounds? Bike I ride, the, yeah, the bike I ride, oh, 60 pounds, 24, 25 kilo, kilograms, yeah. All right in that range. Uh, my bike I ride now in Costa Rica is 19 kilograms with the battery. And the battery is another three, four kilograms. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Well, what would you say to youngsters that want to start traveling, rather like backpacking or cycling touring? What would be your advice for them? Start now, as soon as you can. Uh, <laughs> Uh, hit the road go with your backpack, uh, go to Europe, go to Asia, Southeast Asia, wherever. Uh, it's great. Uh, I think the more people that travel, the sooner they travel, they learn the different cultures and break down a lot of stereotypes and probably could solve a lot of problems in this world if more people traveled and, and spent time with the local people in the various continents of the world. Uh, and on the other hand, yeah, just, you, go for it. I said, just do it. I mean, uh, yeah, you got a problem. Well, solve the problem, uh, you know. That, uh, Learn from your mistakes. Part, part of the fun of traveling is uh, problem solving. <laughs> and on the other hand, what would you say to seniors that thinks that fun is over when they turn 60 and they don't want to do anything and then 
they think they're too old, I'm too old to do this. I can hear this from my own parents. My parents always tell me, oh, I'm too old. <laughs> yeah. Uh, since I've been doing the long distance cycling on all my trips, I've always been the oldest person. And I've always got comments from younger people, uh, people in maybe their 60s or late 50s. Oh, my God, Bob, uh, it's so nice to be riding with you. I thought I would be over. I wouldn't be riding. Now you're riding at 74 or what, 75 or whatever. Now I know I can do it. So I give them some motivation just that they see me. Um, I remember riding in India and big crowds would come around and they would look at you and how old are you? And I, I was 72, I think at the time. I'm 72 and they'd say, oh my God, here um, when you're 50, 55, God comes down, grabs you by the hair and takes you to heaven, you know? Uh, what do you do? I said, nothing, we just ride. And uh, I think later that day was the first time I shaved my head so God couldn't come down and grab my hair and take me to heaven. So I've, I've had a shaved head ever since. So. But yeah, get the seniors, uh, try and get out of your comfort zone. Uh, try something new. Uh, you get out of your comfort zone for one thing, and then it becomes your comfort zone. And then you sort of got to keep going. Um, I know on Facebook, on Facebook groups, when I posted what I'm about to do, I get a lot of comments to, from seniors saying, thank you, you've motivated us, we know we can try it, you know. Uh, so that was one of my goals for doing this too, is to educate the younger generation and to educate the older generation that we can still do it. Uh, oh. You don't have to ride from Alaska to Panama, but you can. Age is just a number. Yeah, exactly. Age is just a number. <laughs> AD and living the dream sort of thing. You know? Yeah. So how people can get in touch with you if they want to, to meet you or if they want to talk to you, where, where can they do that? Uh, well, they can email me at, uh, I'll say this kind of slowly, R for Robert. I can, I can put it e. in the description below as well. I will put oh, okay. your email address in the description yeah, can, so people can contact you directly. Uh, contact me on my email at rdf3636 at gmail.com. And I will send them, if they ask for it, my itinerary, a day by day itinerary, if they want to know the route or they want to ride part of the day with me or whatever they wish. Uh, so they can do that. If they wish, uh, to donate, maybe in your description, you could put my crowdfunding page. Oh, so where they can go and, yeah, and they can buy a book, uh, a future book, uh, pre-selling the book called uh, Octogenarian Odyssey, trading a sofa for a bicycle seat. Uh, and they can go there and buy a book or just leave a donation if they're so inclined. Yeah, how much is the donation? Well, whatever you want, uh, you can buy a book for $15 Canadian, so that's about $12 American, and uh, or they can go to a donation section and donate whatever they want, want. Nice. Do you have any plan after this trip that you have already in mind that you would like to do maybe for next year? Or... Well, so many things. One depends on finishing the trip. Um, the second one, how happy is my wife uh, after five months on the road? Uh, <laughs> although she's going to join me in a number of locations for, uh, you know, a few days each time. She wants to see Alaska. She wants to be in Oregon in the United States for my 80th birthday. She'll probably join me in Mexico uh, City, that kind of thing. Um, so a plan would be to finish the job, to get from Panama to Venezuela and Argentina. Uh, I spent some time in Bolivia, and in Bolivia, I was fortunate to take a tour on the salt flats uh, in Bolivia. And it's amazing. I couldn't believe uh, 
the, being there in the salt flats, a big lake of salt. And, and I'm looking in the distance and I see a black spot coming across. Said, what the hell is that? Oh my God, it's a guy on a bicycle and he's fully loaded with front panniers, back panniers, everything. So we stop him, of course, and uh, he's a fellow from Germany and he'd started in Alaska and he's going across. I said, how can you find your way across this big salt lake? There's no road or anything. He said, oh, just my GPS keeps pointing in the right direction. So I just follow it. <laughs> and then he went on and disappeared. And I thought, oh, I'm going to ride across the salt lake some, someday too. So. All right. Maybe I'll come with you. <laughs> okay, good. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. It was very, very nice to meet you, Bob. Thank you very, very much for today. Well, uh, thank you. Um, it was just a pleasure. Uh, love talking to you. Love meeting you. I got to get to Malaysia. <laughs> if you ever come to Malaysia, you can contact me and we will welcome you with pleasure. Okay, well, we'll do that. I'm not sure when, but... Uh, I don't know when. Know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank do, you, Roman. Do you want to say anything to our to the people that are listening to the podcast before we say goodbye? Well, uh, thank you for spending the time with me. Uh, I hope it was interesting, but uh, let me encourage you to have some dreams, get out of your comfort zone and uh, try something new, try something different. Uh, sorry, uh, keep going with this, but I remember when I was climbing Kilimanjaro and the night before we summited or the day before we're summited, I kept thinking, oh my God, why am I doing this? I'm going to die up here. What, you know, how stupid was I, you know, stuff like that. You summit, it becomes part of your story. You've done that. You've got out of your comfort zone. Now it's not a big deal. Like you got to get through that why am I doing this kind of thing? And then when you come out the other side, it, uh, it's remarkable and you think, oh, that wasn't so bad, you know? Exactly. Anyway, uh, thank you, Roman. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you so much. I wish you uh, an amazing day and talk to you soon. Okay, we'll keep in touch, mate. Okay. Thank you. Ciao.